I want to sincerely thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in this event because um, it is such a pleasure to participate in, in something that honors uh, Peter Piot, who is someone who I have tremendous respect, admiration, and affection for. And um, I think it's, it's great to be participating in this um, event. So what you're going to see today is a little bit of a schizophrenic presentation. Um, until about five weeks ago, I was leading Merck's Ebola vaccine development effort. And as of five weeks ago, I became the president and CEO of the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative. So people have kidded me that now that Ebola is taken care of, you have to go take on AIDS. Well, I don't know about that. But it is a little bit interesting that my career um, is paralleling Peter's a little bit, since I never thought that I would get involved in Ebola until um, this past year, actually about a year ago um, now. And, uh, but <clears throat> I have been involved in HIV for a long time. What I want to talk to you today is really about the experience of developing the VSV Ebola vaccine um, from the preclinical stage to um, clinical evidence of vaccine efficacy that Gary um, referred to. And it's not just the science of it, which is important, but it's really the partnerships that, that made that possible and the lessons learned about what worked, what may not have worked, and, and what do we need to do better for the future, because it's not just relevant for Ebola, as Peter um, had articulated earlier today. It's relevant for all kinds of other um, infectious disease threats that we'll face, including ones that we have faced for a long time and haven't solved. Um, <clears throat> just to begin, I want to take a couple of uh, quotes from uh, Peter's memoirs. And if you haven't actually read this book, it's a great book, and you should. It's about um, his life and professional career and has a lot of very interesting and relevant um, insights about the complexity of science and, and human nature and how we both need to and can do better in the future. In his book, at the preface, he quotes uh, Jonathan Mann, who I think many of you know is a remarkable individual in his own right, and really sort of reflects on how um, the best parts of human nature emerge when we're faced with significant challenges. And when the history of AIDS is written, the fact that people endured um, will probably be the most important part of that story. What is um, implicit in this, and, and Peter touches on in his own comment, is um, it's not just that tendency to stand up, not run away, and, and be brave. It's the fact that you need leadership to, to make that possible and inspire people. And both Jonathan and Peter are, in my book, um, true leaders. And I think that kind of leadership is going to be necessary moving forward in getting us to do the hard work to figure out how to work together as effectively as we possibly can to deliver necessary uh, public health innovations. Um, interestingly, you know, as Peter reflecting on his career in Ebola and HIV in his book also talked about the fact that you know, we, we will face and have faced emerging infectious disease threats. These were not previously predictable, but now they're something we expect to happen on a, a regular, if not increasing, basis. And we do, in fact, need to be prepared to know how to deal with these as effectively as possible. And I'm, I don't think that the world actually knows how to do that. And that is, in fact, the challenge before us. And, and we'll talk more about that. Um, what I want to talk to you about today is really go through the development of the uh, what Merck refers to as the V920 Ebola vaccine, which is the recombinant vesicular stomatitis uh, virus vaccine that expresses the Ebola Zaire um, envelope like a protein that Gary described. Talk about um, where that came from, what the preclinical data was, what the clinical development was. Uh, for that that led up to an efficacy signal, um, what additional work is going on to enable that product to achieve licensure, and talk about how that experience may be relevant for uh, doing um, even better in the future, not only for current problems such as AIDS, but uh, future public health emergencies. Um, you've seen a slide like this on, on many occasions, and I just want to reflect back to the uh, September 
October timeframe when the upslope in number of cases was first seen. And at this time, there were actually projections that there were going to be over a million cases of Ebola. Fortunately, that didn't materialize, but there was such a level of concern. And as you can imagine, working for a large pharmaceutical company, there's a sincere interest on the part of the leadership and the employees to do something to address a public health threat like that. And you won't be surprised to know that lots of external parties were asking us to get involved. And I know this is true for many other uh, pharmaceutical companies. And Paul Stoffels is here to talk about uh, Janssen's um, experience. And, and I think there is a sincere interest in contributing, but figuring out how to do that is important. And you want to contribute in a unique way. And clearly, that Vaccines is something that Merck's has done for a long time. And um, you know, while we knew that there were promising candidates being advanced by GSK and Janssen that had preclinical data, there was a candidate that had originally been developed by Canadian scientists at the Public Health Agency of Canada that was not really progressing as quickly as people thought that it, it should. And in looking at that candidate, we thought that there were a lot of um, promising attributes for it. And since you never know in vaccine development which approach is going to work, you want to have as many so-called shots on goal, since we're in Canada, if we can talk about a hockey analogy, to make sure that you get it licensed, you get something that's a valuable intervention. So we thought that given the attributes of that vaccine, given that it's very related to a lot of things that Merck had a lot of experience with, that that would be a very valuable way for us to engage. Merck's willingness and ability to engage was predicated on a number of assumptions. Um, one is that there was a tremendous public health imperative, and this was an area where we thought we could do something that would be helpful. Secondly, and this is important, it was understood from the very beginning that this was not a commercial opportunity, and in fact, the company stands to lose a significant amount of money or face significant opportunity costs related to other programs, but that the company was worth taking that on in order to contribute to addressing a public health emergency, but the, our ability to do that was enhanced significantly by the fact that we would be doing this in the context of a public-private partnership where we thought we would be dealing with public stakeholders that would be sharing their expertise, their resources, and sharing risk, ideally, with us as we progress down this. And the question that you always have to ask is, if you build it, will they come? You know, there was a signal that others, if the vaccine was shown to be efficacious, that there would be opportunities for procurement and delivery of that vaccine. All of this hasn't exactly worked out as planned, but that is the basic the construct in which, under which we engaged. Gary talked a bit about the vaccine, so I won't go into great detail about it, but the favorable attributes to us was that this vaccine had been shown in preclinical models, including the very stringent non-human primate models, um, that it demonstrated 100% efficacy against very high dose lethal challenge um, with virulent Ebola virus um, with a single dose. And at least in some instances, that protection where it was assessed was, was very durable. Um, it was effective both in pre-exposure prophylaxis as well as some indication that there was benefits in post-exposure prophylaxis. Gary described it, so I won't go into detail about it. But basically, an important attribute of this is that because of this recombinant structure, the replication of the recombinant vaccine is actually dependent on continued expression of the Ebola, glyco pro Ebola, Ebola virus glycoprotein. So as it replicates in a vaccinated individual, it's spreading from cell to cell in the same way that Ebola would in exposing the immune system to very relevant uh, immunologic targets um, by virtue of doing so. Um, and that we thought was very relevant and distinguished it from the other replication defective um, vectors that were being advanced by others. There's a lot of preclinical data that I'll just go through very quickly. Um, you'll note the dates about some of this dating back to 2005 or around there where it was shown to protect 100% efficacy, single dose. It could protect against multiple strains. As Gary said, you could actually combine vaccines to get multiple protection against multiple different strains with a single vaccine or combinations of vaccine. It protected against challenge by multiple routes. Um, it was uh, safe in immunodeficient animals. It wasn't neurovirulent, which is very important. It had durable protection, at least in the Marburg context, out to 14 months, which is the last 
uh, date that was ever tested. Um, it is an important question to continue to assess. Um, and importantly, in studies by Heinz Feldman's group that just recently came out, is that the vaccine will protect animals significantly within seven days after the initial vaccination, which is very important. And interestingly, that seems to be borne out in people um, as well. And it also protects against the current outbreak strain. So that's all very um, positive information. So it went with that tremendous preclinical data and basically more or less sat on the shelf. And the reason for that is I think up until this recent outbreak, people didn't think we would need an Ebola vaccine for the pe reasons Peter talked about. And if we had an Ebola vaccine, there wasn't clarity around how that would be tested. And I think all of that changed with the recent outbreak. And what happened then was really a function of a really remarkable partnership of multiple different organizations. So the phase one studies that were conducted um, involved multiple collaborators, as did the phase two, three studies, as I mentioned. The vaccine was developed by Public Health Agency of Canada and then licensed to New Link Genetics, a company, small biotech in Iowa. Um, but then, um, you know, in a very short order, beginning last October, it entered into literally eight independent phase one clinical trials that were all sponsored by independent investigators, a number of them funded by the Wellcome Trust and coordinated by the WHO in Switzerland, Germany, Gabon, and Kenya, a study at the Canadian Center for Vaccinology in Halifax. Uh, the U.S. Department of Defense was incredibly supportive, including studies at Walter Reed, a study at NIAID, New Link Genetics had their own study, and the support I want to highlight of the U.S. Defense Department, in, in particular DITRA and JVAP and, and BARDA, um, were really incredibly important because they had invested in the manufacture of this vaccine um, so that it was available to go into clinical trials even before the outbreak occurred um, last, last summer, and, and that really expedited things tremendously. Typically, as you have heard, vaccine development is a very um, protracted process that typically takes 15 to 20 years, and it involves multiple stages from discovery to clinical evaluation to optimizing production and then having sustainable supply. The whole regulatory framework is very complicated, and that typically takes a very long time. So if we were typically starting in 2014, we might expect to have a vaccine sometime after uh, 2025 or so. so you know, and one important aspect of that that isn't fully appreciated is typically vaccine development takes place in the context of a single vaccine company where you actually have a lot of control over decision-making processes. There's what we call an end-to-end -end perspective that you can maintain constant vision, really targeting what's going to be needed by the person who's going to receive the vaccine and be able to enforce that in a, in a rigorous way. That's hard enough to do in a single company. It's even harder to do when you're talking about involving multiple stakeholders. And so that's a skill that um, really hadn't been tested, I don't think, to this extent before. So how did this play out? So the first in human study actually was October 13th of 2014. By January 25th, we had generated enough data to actually make a decision about what dose of the vaccine to use to go into uh, phase two, three studies. Um, and there, soon thereafter, on February 2nd, the initiation of the first phase two, three study in Liberia, the PREVAIL study by the NIH and their Liberian colleagues. About a month later, the Guinea study, the ring vaccination study, um, began in, in Guinea. And then about a month after that, the CDC phase three study in Sierra Leone, the so-called STRIVE study, uh, began um, in, in Sierra Leone. And by July 31st, the data from Guinea, um, the interim analysis, suggested a high level of, of vaccine efficacy. And very soon thereafter, they started deploying this vaccine, not just it, as to study it, but as a public health intervention to try to stem uh, the outbreak and get it to zero. And it is, in fact, being used in that context um, to this date. And, and subsequently, shortly thereafter, Merck initiated our own phase three study, generating information that's going to be necessary for, for licensure. Um, the actual pathway to licensure of an Ebola vaccine is not entirely certain and is still a work in process. It's helped tremendously by the fact that there is evidence of vaccine efficacy or effectiveness, but there are also opportunities to try to bridge between non-human primate studies and human immune responses, even when you don't have a signal of efficacy, to have a so-called accelerated approval pathway that the FDA and other regulators um, have developed. And Merck was trying to generate evidence to support all of these different um, pathways 
and importantly, you have to demonstrate safety, you have to demonstrate manufacturing consistency, and you have to ideally demonstrate clinical benefit in some way. To give you an idea about how the dose selection decision was made, that was made by giving non-human primates different doses of the vaccine, and you can see a high level of protection in all of the doses that were studied, but there was one animal that um, became infected at the lower dose. Um, it wasn't entirely obvious that that animal had a markedly lower immune response shown in pig here than the other animals who were protected, and that's an area that needs additional work, but it does seem to be that there's a trend towards higher antibody responses and greater protection. Um, in order to get more data in humans about the dose response, again, the eight phase one clinical trials that I mentioned scattered around the world were conducted and pulling the data from those studies um, you can see where they looked at very different doses in different populations in a significant number of individuals. It became very clear a couple of things about the vaccine. One, it does transiently replicate in vaccinated individuals, um, and that we thought would be the case, and it's important to demonstrate. Importantly, there is a dose response with respect to immunogenicity of the vaccine, looking at time after vaccination and antibody levels by a GP ELISA. The higher the dose, the higher the antibody level, and at the two times 10 to the seventh dose, it was statistically significantly superior. That was also true when one looked at neutralizing antibody responses, and based on those data and the lack of a safety association between the different doses studied, um, we went ahead with the two times 10 to the seventh dose into the various phase three studies. They each had different uh, study designs. The Prevail study in Liberia looked at the GSK chimp adenovector, including the Merck V920 vaccine versus placebo. It was a randomized placebo-controlled trial. Um, the Guinea study, the ring vaccination study, as well as a frontline healthcare worker study that MSF conducted. Um, this was conducted by the WHO and the Norwegian Institute of Public Health and CDC and their collaborators um, in Sierra Leone did a, a variation of a step wedge uh, study where they were vaccinating populations at different times as well. They were randomized to immediate versus delayed groups. Um, in the ring vaccination study were individuals e who were either contacts of people with Ebola or contacts of contacts either got the vaccine immediately once that ring was identified or they were randomized to get it uh, 21 days later and you compare infection rates in the different situations and importantly using the cutoff of 10 days that had been um, pre-specified. Um, there were zero cases of Ebola infection in the group that received the vaccine immediately versus um, 16 in the delayed group, which, you know, was imputed to be an efficacy of 100 percent. Again, that obviously needs to be validated with larger numbers, should that be possible. But it was a clear signal about the vaccine efficacy that was quite convincing and statistically significant. And with that data, the, the Data Safety Monitoring Board recommending stopping randomizing from immediate to delayed vaccination and implementing, continuing the study, but everyone would receive the vaccine immediately. Shortly thereafter, based on data in pediatric populations emerging from Guinea, the vaccine is now being uh, administered to individuals down to the age of, of six, and it continues to chase um, cases of Ebola that might emerge in Guinea. Um, again, all the different studies, just to give you a sense now that so far over 13,000 people have been vaccinated with the vaccine, and of those, uh, about 12,700 have received the target um, dose that is being um, advanced towards licensure. From a safety perspective, there has been some early reactogenicity that has been described but is self-limited and generally mild. Um, there have been instances of arthralgia seen in a number of vaccinees that is transient and rare cases of transient arthritis that have been reported from some sites, but in most sites it's a very low level, and this clearly is an important issue to assess in future follow-up. And it was felt that given the severity of the disease, the risk-benefit ratio would favor moving forward with uh, taking this to licensure. So a number of studies are now underway to do that. Um, the so-called safety and immunogenicity study, a large phase three study that Merck is doing to demonstrate the lot consistency of the manufacturing process, looking at 
HIV-infected individuals, which is a study that Merck will be doing in collaboration with the Canadian Consortium, and additional studies in pediatric populations, both in Gabon, um, in Guinea, that extension has happened, as I mentioned, and the Canadian Consortium is also thinking about additional studies um, in children. So all of this data from the safety database, the chemistry manufacturing and controls information necessary for licensure, and the efficacy data, both from the monkeys as well as people, is being put together in a licensure package. Exactly when licensure might be accomplished is not known, but all of that data will be available um, next year. So is the story over? No, the story's not over. Um, as you know, um, there was a period um, where we thought we might have gotten to zero. There was a two-week period where there were no cases of Ebola reported in West Africa, but those uh, last week there were three cases reported all in Guinea. And then there's this awareness of the persistent shedding that's been reported as well as potential late relapses. So we don't really know what the dynamics of actually getting and keeping this outbreak to zero is going to be, but I do think vaccines are going to play an important role in it. And there is ongoing work to deploy the vaccine, this vaccine, in, in that context in advance of product licensure, and there's a need to develop the regulatory framework to do that um, with clarity. Um, so just to conclude this section, um, you know, there's a strong preclinical foundation for the vaccine. The clinical data, both safety and immunogenicity, is encouraging. The efficacy results from uh, Guinea are um, very relevant, unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, but because the fact that the outbreak had gotten to zero in um, Liberia and Sierra Leone, those phase three studies will not be providing efficacy data, all they will provide a lot of safety and immunogenicity data, which will be very relevant. Um, Merck is scaling up manufacturing of this vaccine and in the process of developing multivalent vaccines as well as novel formulations that will be more thermostable. So that sounds like a really good story, right? The problem is that you should not conclude from that story that um, this is a model for the future. I mean, in, in many ways, we are lucky that it worked out the way that it did. And it wasn't necessarily the best way to do it in such a, I won't say uncoordinated, but not specifically coordinated manner. We need to act in a more proactive than ad hoc, responsive, reactive um, manner. And when you think about important questions about regulatory and policy decisions, how do they integrate? How do you think about deployment? How do you think about procurement? How do all of those things fit together? We don't really have the answers to those, and it's not really clear now who's actually making decisions about this, but I'm sure Paul Stavels will probably talk about it. When a company's thinking about launching a program like this, you need to have that interface with the public sector so that there's confidence that we're both rowing together to uh, achieve the goal, and I think that's something that needs to be um, sorted out. So just some thoughts um, in conclusion, and these are more my thoughts than, than, than Merck's thoughts, is I think the recent outbreak was um, important in, in sort of testing the system, and I think it does demonstrate that the public sector and private sector can work together very effectively, but we need new models to make that happen. The extent to which we persist and actually get these vaccines across the finish line, I think is going to be important for gauging whether um, companies in similarly uh, invest in these kinds of programs in the future. If the world doesn't persist to get these vaccines licensed and deployed, it's gonna be harder to motivate companies to get involved um, in the future. So I think we need to be thoughtful about how the res our response here is going to be predictive of enabling other things. Um, earlier this morning, you heard Peter ask this question, will Ebola be a game changer like HIV was and we should not miss the opportunity to take this to the next level and I couldn't agree more um, with that and I think if we actually don't do that, um, that will be very problematic and, and I think future responses will be less effective rather than than more effective. So we do need to figure out ways of working together between the public and private sector in proactive strategic ways that really enable us to address public health preparedness. I think we need to think about how to go after targets that we know exist as well as develop platform technologies and approaches for vaccines that we 
may not even know the names of the pathogens yet, but we know certain classes like coronaviruses are out there waiting to emerge. We need platform technologies that will let us develop and deploy the vaccines quickly. We need to understand what the clinical development and regulatory pathways are to get us there. There was a lot of debate about the ring vaccination study methodology. There shouldn't be debate about those things. There should be consensus in advance about what the right approach is. And I, my hat is off to the people who did that study in Guinea, because that's the first time that we've demonstrated efficacy in the context of an outbreak in very challenging circumstances. And I think they deserve a huge amount of um, credit. Um, so we need not only to understand the science of development of these products, we need to understand the science of how to work together as partners as effectively as possible. Um, lots of stakeholders, lots of issues. Right now, they're not really connected. There's nothing connecting these different segments. We need to make those connections so that we can develop licensed products in an outbreak setting. So that's the emergency response. You know, it's still the situation that Peter referred to. We still don't have an HIV vaccine, and that's why I went to work at IAVI to try to get these multi-sector public-private partnerships to work. And it's important to note, this disease has been around for over 30 years, and more people die of HIV infection and become infected with HIV each week than died in the entire um, Ebola outbreak last year, but it doesn't have the same urgency. And we do need to do, as Peter and his colleagues said in the Taking the Long-Term View, the AIDS 2031 consortium that Peter and Heidi were very involved with, that we do need a different approach to HIV vaccine development. We can't do this as business as usual if we're going to expect a result. And I think there, too, the science of public-private partnerships is going to be very important, and how we work together is going to be um, an essential enabler of whether we succeed or whether we don't, and whether we exhibit the kind of leadership that uh, John Jonathan Mann and Peter Piot have um, encouraged us to do. So um, Gary showed this slide also, just so you know the context here. Um, Jeremy Farrar, who's the director of the Wellcome Trust, sent this around after the Guinea results uh, came out. This was a young girl in Liberia who had family members uh, die of Ebola. And you know, it does you know, put context into like why you do um, this work. I think it is really about people's lives who really don't have people advocating for them, and that's up to us to do. So that's a, a big responsibility, and I think we can do really well if we take it seriously. So there were a huge number of people involved in this. All of my colleagues at Merck, at New Link, our various um, partners and collaborating organizations that I mentioned, um, a huge number of individual investigators who worked really hard to make this uh, happen um, as quickly as possible, and it's been a great privilege to be able to work uh, collaboratively with them. So thanks very much for the opportunity to be here.